Kia ora. welcome to the first series of Stuff That Matters Now, a podcast brought to you by Collective Intelligence. I'm Harv, a.k.a. Ian Harvey, founder of Collective Intelligence, and it's going to be my great pleasure in this series to introduce to you a bunch of really cool people who are making a difference in the world every single day. Our job here at Collective Intelligence is to help curious people evolve and become more courageous so they can tackle the stuff that's needed to make this world a better place. You're about to listen to an epic chat I've just had with one of our many change-making Collective Intelligence members. Let's have a quick listen to a wee clip of some of the stuff we've talked about to give you an idea of what's ahead. Create more value, solve more problems, have more impact. That's what innovation is, right? And we apply it to businesses and products and technology. We don't stop. I mean, most people spend, you know, hours, days and weeks planning their wedding, their holiday, their house renovation. How much time do you spend designing and innovating your own life, thinking about your career, being conscious, having conversations in the workplace about what else you can do, what other value you can create? I've learned through adversity and tragedy that people are capable of so much you know, young people are capable of so much, middle-aged people, old people. We're all capable of so much. We just need to be unlocked and allowed. And creativity, good creative processes, create a safe space for people to explore that. So we help people design multiple possible futures. Before we crack on and talk about the stuff today's guest had to share with us, a big shout-out to Rob McDonald and his talented team at, at T. Wonger at State over there in Hawke's Bay. Not only do these guys make international gold medal winning wines, they've helped us bring this podcast to your ears. Brilliant stuff. Thank you, Rod. Today I get a chance to interview Melissa Jenner, who has had a fascinating journey uh, through her life, mostly overseas in the corporate world, flicking between New York and London. She also survived the Twin Tower attack uh, in New York. Uh, and I was fascinated to to hear what that was like and to go through that. Melissa now works with people, helping them find purpose and meaning in their work. Uh, I was shocked to find 67% of people are not connected at work and just going through the motions. So Melissa has developed a method to help people find their passion and what they want to do. So listen up, it's going to be fascinating to hear. Here we are at the Ice House in Parnell, and I'm talking to Mel Jenner, uh, who is back from her voyage around the world in the last, well, oh, I won't go into how many years, Mel, 15 years. She's just mouthed at me, you can't see that. Uh, Mel, thank you for talking to me this morning. I'm really excited about this podcast because Mel is, uh, has started a company called Start Now. Uh, and it's around fi- helping people find their purpose purpose and a sustainable uh, career and to help them to transition from where they might be a bit stuck into a better future, which is a huge um, problem for lots of people. The world is changing really fast. So Mel, thank you for your time this morning. Thanks for asking me to be here. So... What I want to do, Mel, is you have had a fascinating background and, you know, you're one of these Kiwis that have gone out in the world and travelled and and worked in these different spaces around the world and brought all that experience back to New Zealand and it's always such a cool thing to see people come back to New Zealand uh, and to bring all that experience back. So, um, and and it's interesting with what you're doing now because you know, I think all that, all that comes back mm. to New Zealand, which is very cool. Mm. So, I Mel, mean, just give us, give uh, the listeners an idea of your journey. Where did, where, where did, where you were born? Where did, where did you come from? <laughs> thanks, um, thanks for that. Let's start at the beginning. Uh, I was born in Auckland at Henderson Hospital. Um, I was born to a sixteen-year-old single woman, a solo mother. And she was in a very religious family, and her parents told her that back in the late 1960s that uh, that wasn't going to happen for her. So I was put up for adoption, 
and my parents came and found me at uh, Henderson Hospital. And I joined a family uh, of three brothers uh, and myself. My parents were very courageous. They adopted three children and then miraculously had their fourth child. Um, And so grew up in a very diverse, interesting family in that four children with different parents, Um, three children who were, uh, in my mother's words, specially chosen, and one who was just normal, and he was very unhappy about that. (laughs) Her natural um, son thought he was uh, very... Very disadvantaged by just being born, not being specially chosen. Um, so we, my parents, my parents managed a very interesting dynamic with us all. Um, but yeah, very. It was like growing up in a tribe. You know, there was there was three brothers. There was a band of kind of children who had who who had this. What I've learned from that, I guess, is we all had the same values and we were shared. We had shared values set, but we came from very diverse backgrounds and stories. Um, and so, and that, then one poor bugger, he just got born into the family. <laughs> he didn't normally. have a choice. Right. Yeah, he just arrived. He was, and he, he, um, he, my, my, my dearest youngest brother. Um, so yeah, it was a, it was a great. It was one of those wonderful. We we grew up in South Auckland and Manurewa. Uh, my parents were very middle class, very hard working. Um, because they'd chosen so intentionally to have a family, you know, they they really did pour all their love and attention into us. And so I guess that's that was my kind of blessed start really um, yeah so that's kind of where I grew up South Auckland was a great place to grow up and I think you know later in the story I'm sure we'll talk about my time in East London and it does sort of remind me when I got to East London it was sort of like a second home in terms of multiculturalism uh, you know grew up in in, in, a, in, a, in a part of Auckland that I now find very rich and colourful South Auckland um, uh, yeah and so that was kind of but my parents made lots of sacrifices to send us to good schools and yeah, so that was that was my start. Interesting, isn't it? Because um, well, my impression, you know, or uh, impression of lots of people in South Auckland, you know, it's it's a shithole. It's a terrible place. It's you know, it's got all the problems, and you know, we don't uh, we we forget don't talk about it. It's down there, and it's it's a problem. So it's lovely to hear. Uh, a different side of South Auckland. Well, they say you should never forget where you came from, and um, I have a lot of friends in Auckland who never live outside their sort of their sort of um, shire. They call it the shire of Central Auckland. But actually, Auckland is an incredible city. It's very diverse. Uh, we should celebrate that, and we should learn from it. And um, I've done some work out in South Auckland since I've been back in New Zealand, and um, yeah, yeah. I also th- I also think greatness comes out of yeah. hardship, and there's some wonderful, hardworking families. There's lots of immigrants there. That's it's it really is what makes Auckland one of the biggest super diverse cities in the world. A lot of that is in South Auckland, which is a huge opportunity for us economically if we get it right out there. And there's some really interesting things going on out there, mm. which mm. a lot of people don't know about. You're right. Most yeah. people just yeah. think of Auckland as downtown, well, the city of sales, and yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, and it's a one dimensional thing, mm. and you've got the Jaffers, and you know it's all that sort of bullshit. Yeah. It's look we're diverting, but it's interesting, Mel, because the I get frustrated when um, you know I live in Manor too, provincial New Zealand. When I hear people who are very disparaging about Auckland, and I go, hang on, without Auckland, we're Fiji with a shitty climate. You know, Auckland is so important; it's our only international city, mm. uh, and uh, it's really important. Yeah, if we can get it right in Auckland, I think we can get it right for the country. So if you think about um, inequality, if you think about diversity and inclusion, if you think about um, startup businesses succeeding, you know, we have to figure out how that works for us in New Zealand. And I think we've got the petri dish in Auckland to sort of build that infrastructure, build that um, spider web, and then, you know, we can easily replicate. And that's what's okay. happened in the United Kingdom. You know, London works, now Manchester works, Birmingham works. You know, and those cities have really kind of grown up as satellite cities as London's become more powerful. And I think that's the journey that we're on here in New Zealand. And I think we should celebrate what we've got in Auckland. Okay. Mm. Okay. All right. So we've, we're getting ahead of ourselves. So going back, so you grew up in this, in this uh, family of, of four kids, one normal one, three unnormal ones. And what was the vision uh, as a teenager? Well, what do you want to do with your life? Um, like a lot of families, my parents encouraged us to go to university, and um, two out of the four of us did. I went to university for about a year and a half when I left school. I graduated at 16. I was dying to get out of school. I was one of those kids that didn't really respond well to the formal learning environment. <laughs> um, was more of a learning-by-doing person, found the structure of schools, which I know has changed now, quite frustrating. Couldn't wait to leave, left after what was the sixth form, which is now year 12, 
um, and went to university and lasted about a year and a half. Same pattern emerged, didn't enjoy the formal learning environment, got an opportunity to go to work. And this is where my enthusiasm for work, who, shaping your life, really, really started when right. I was 17 and a half. I started a, a, a full-time job as an office junior. Uh, and literally made ten thousand dollars a year. Gosh, it's fun to think back now, right? I felt so wealthy having ten thousand dollars a year. I was going to say, look, <laughs> the, you guys can't see this, but Mel was just lit up with with <laughs> the memory, the memory of getting a first job. Yeah, it was. Um, and and that, as I say, that you know, I threw myself out of university because I just it just didn't feel like it was serving me. And I think it's interesting now that young people have that same experience as you know, that you, university either works for you or it doesn't. I'm a kind of learning by the school of life sort of person. I've gone back to university since and done other sort of short courses. And but it but it was just I was in such a hurry to explore work. <laughs> At 17 and a half, you know, my father was like driving me to job interviews, sort of thinking, "Gosh, wh- you know, where's this child going to end up?" Um, but it was the right thing for me. He supported me. He was like he had that mindset of you know, you've got to do your best and you're winning if you're doing your best, if you're trying mm. your hardest. So so I got, you know, so I started work and uh, that's where the story kind of began. And so my 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 sense of work as a big part of your self-identity started right back then when I was sort of quite young and that's what I'm really passionate about is helping people make sure work. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So the roots mm. of that is what right back then. Mm. So what was, so from there what happened, Mel? How long were you on that? In that space. Wow. Um, yeah. I mean, that was back in the late eighties, and I worked. I joined a stockbroking firm uh, with my ten thousand dollars that I earned. I, over two years, managed to invest about seven thousand in the stock market, and lost it all. Um, I was going to say time. I was going. Yeah, time was timing wasn't on my side. Um, so you know, did my first career pivot as a result of that. Really lived through the stock market crash. Uh, spent a little bit of time working at companies like Equity Corp. I don't know if any one of your yep. listeners remembers Equity Corp. One of we the, do have some older listeners. Well, one of the shocking, you know, New Zealand capitalist stories of, you know, a family, a family, you know, with very unregulated kind of financial business um, that went under. And there's me at sort of 18 years old on the phone to people who had bought shares and equity court properties, put their put their life savings into it, phoning me up, wanting to speak to the Hawkins family. I'm 18 years old, I'm answering the phone. My first taste of, you know, kind of capitalism going wrong. And um, so, yeah, I had about four or five years kind of working in that stock market kind of uh, environment, a couple of share broking firms, got made redundant, worked at equity port, got made redundant, figured out that that was probably not sustainable. <laughs> um, but man, what a, what a pressure cooker to It was induction by off. fire, yeah. Wow. Yeah, it was, it was tumultuous and it was, uh, what's the word, high energy, um, you know, quite fiery, you know, like lots of big characters, you know, when you're working for Alan Hawkins' family back yeah. then. Um, you know, I used to go down into the stock exchange on Queen Street. I was a script clerk. I had like, you know, the shares in my in my bag, you know, trading them in the boxes with other. It was a very, you know, the chalkies were on the boards, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, you yeah. remember those days. Anyway, um, it was an interesting, it was a really interesting learning experience. Uh, look, the chalkies, you know, that should have been made into a sport. <laughs> I you really know, wanted to be one. <laughs> that, should have been, that should have been a sport at the Olympics, watching them. Watching them, I just, I just sat there and, you know, you'd just go, how do they do that? But, you know, these were the days with, you know, rife sexism. You know, these women were um, idolised mainly because they looked pretty and they had short skirts on. They stood up on, on podiums with chalk. You know, they were very, very talented. But the way they got talked about was was an almost objectification, you know. And right. there was no senior woman in business when I was this young person. And looking back on it, you know... I, I, I'm just so so joyful that business has changed so much because there was a lot of objectification of women back then. You you remember it, you know, men in suits and it yeah, was yeah, it yeah. was mad men. It really was. <laughs> and and well, you know what? It's I know lots of people aren't happy about the world at the moment and, and things can get better and so forth, but you know what, we've come a bloody long way. Yeah. From we have. from from those days, right? Yeah, we've 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 evolved, we've accepted and we've changed and Lots of stories about the financial markets, you know, even up until recently, you know, I've experienced sexism and all kinds of things and poor behaviour, but it is it is being addressed now and I'm so glad for women in business that we're finally starting to see that curve change. Because yeah. yeah. just, just before that period, it would only have been about five years before that period, 
Marilyn Waring was the only female in the National Party mm. and was treated like shit, mm. you know, and, um, mm. yeah. So, so yeah, so I did, did my first career pivot, uh, decided that that industry was a little bit too uh, fiery for me as a young, as a young woman, uh, and my older brother was studying marketing at university, and um, I started reading all his books uh, when he came home from Waikato on, on holiday, uh, and was just absorbing all his marketing books and decided I could do marketing. And my brother was like, when we get to 40, he said, we'll see who's made it and who's got the highest <laughs> career and the biggest salary. I said, yes, we will see. And guess who that was? He was doing a degree in marketing. I was borrowing his books and just doing being a quick study uh, and got hired by couple of really evolving marketing agencies just as he was coming out of university and we we joke about it now later in life that yeah we did have this kind of um silent race on i was gonna say there's a bit of competition <laughs> in the ml yeah there's a lot of competition with my older brother right. yeah but he's been a great supporter of mine over my lifetime so so that was that was something that really got under your skin yeah, I mean, it was just creative. You know, I felt, I felt like the world I'd come from, stock market was back in the day, very systems oriented, very mathematical, very rigorous, very sexist. Um, and then I found marketing and I found advertising and I found, found creativity, I found design. Uh, and I was fortunate to be hired by, at the time, back in the early 90s, this was, uh, Saatchi and Saatchi Wellington, which was uh, one of the, the greatest creative agencies in the world at its time. And somehow I managed to land a job there, I think purely through charm. You know, I've learned the art of um, the sell and how to how to position yourself into a role. Got hired by Saatchi and Saatchi at the time as an account manager, got promoted to an account director. And I just loved that creative environment, that extreme and intense dedication to good design and um you know a good message these are the days when Saatchi was creating the lotto ads and the um the you know that it was a really fun time to and be Saatchi there. was you know was the sexiest brand in the world at that point now this is the time when advertising you know we don't advertising has changed so much now this was a very sort of sell market you know you would push out at consumers with humor and beauty and you and a lure would draw consumers in and it's obviously it's changed big, big, dramatically uh, big, now big, big, big budgets. budgets a lot of television uh big television shoots often with crews going offshore to do shoots yeah um you know worked on some really interesting campaigns when i was there did the tapapa you know branding and launch worked at first nz capital um montana wines as they were back then designing products and labels and it was just a for me it was um yeah it was cre- it was creativity at its finest um and i just and i loved it i just soaked it up it was a tough environment though you know very very yeah, yeah. Yeah, competitive, you know, to keep your job, you had yeah. to be, which nobody, was good. Nobody, I've never heard anybody say, oh, I worked at an agency, it was really cruisy. No, it was tough. Yeah. Um, and again, they had very high standards and you met their standards. But one thing which stood out for me when I joined the organisation, um, Peter Cullinane, who was the CEO of New Zealand at the time, uh, had a meeting with him, I don't know, it was about a month in, and he, I was very nervous about meeting him, and um, he said to me, uh, don't be nervous. He said, the fact you've got this job, you've already got my respect. Right. It's your job now not to lose it. And I thought, you know, that's really stuck with me as a comment that, you know, when you join a company, I think, the f- you know, someone saying to you, you know, I already respect you. It's your job not to lose it. I, I actually quite like that mindset. It kind of puts you on an equal footing right from the beginning and you're sort of feeling kind of safe. But you're also kind of, you know that there's an expectation of kind of keeping that standard. So. Yeah, it's a good point, though, isn't it? No, no, no. Uh, he set the tone pretty high quite quite early on in there, but yeah, it was a good, it was an interesting place to work. Mm. So that was still in New Zealand. Yeah. Now, um, naturally, like most Kiwis, you know, I'm getting to my mid twenties. I think I was 26 when I went offshore, um, and you know, had that bug to travel, and thank gosh I did. You know, I I spent from 26 to almost 40. Um, traveling and going backwards and forwards from London and New York and to New Zealand. And, um, yeah, the lure of overseas travel, you know, caught me. Uh, moved myself to London on my own. And, um, yeah, I, I, when I when I went to London, I, I sort of – I've always been looking back very intentional about change. And I decided when I went to London I wanted to change things up and I wanted to go out of agencies and go client side. So I had a very intentional goal in my mind to... 
So you're talking to a, um, somebody who has no idea. What does that mean? Oh, okay. So when you're working in an advertising agency, you're sort of on the um, sell side. You are creating work and selling it like a consultant back to your client. So, you know, my client like um, to Papa was buying our advertising campaigns of us. Right. I wanted to be on the client side. I wanted to be designing the campaigns. And so when I went to London, I was very intentional about working not in an agency but working for a corporation. Right. And In-house. Yeah, yeah. And so found my way into Microsoft um, a little bit again by, you know, sort of charm and, and um, charm offence. And this is one thing I coach a lot of people in now is, you know, if you're, you know, 27 years old arriving in London and you can get a job at Microsoft, I believe if I can do that, anyone can. So what, is char- the- what does charm mean? Well, what is, what is that? What is that? I think it's courage. It's um, backing yourself. It's um, reflecting to your audience what they want to hear in a way, but not taking yourself so far out of your comfort zone that you're, you know, you're setting yourself up for failure. So it, it really is courage. It's about being confident enough and believing in yourself enough that um, you can do it and and learning as you go. And I guess I'm, as you can hear from my story, I'm, I I knew that I could learn as I, that was my mode of learning. And so I backed myself. I believed if I. If I could have a decent conversation with someone in a company, uh, I could get on with them, I could tell my story, and they hired me, I could do it. And, yeah, that's always served me quite well. And I, I'm quite um, disheartened by how few young people can do that these days. They they don't have that courage to to sell themselves into something they really want. I really wanted to work in a corporation in marketing. Yeah, and you know what, Mel? I'm not sure my generation were very good at it. I some were so you know you talk about the young people today. I'm going, ah, oh, were we good at that? I'm not sure. I'm not sure because I, I think you know when I when I see your confidence even now talking about that, I'm going that's still a ballsy thing to do to walk into Microsoft and to to put yourself out there. Still, yeah, it's a very brave thing to do. I just don't. Um, genuinely, uh, I guess I wonder why people don't back themselves more. Where does that come from? Because okay. I didn't feel like we, I had we could. We can get into that later yeah. on because this is this is your this is kind you know, of where I'm playing now. Yeah, it's, mm. it's where you're playing now. Mm. Yeah, why don't people do that? Mm. So so, and and going to London, getting this job, you're. What flatting? Yeah. So now you, you now you hit the big the big world the big bad world right, and you are a girl from Auckland who, um, you know, has no idea. You know, I was drawn to England because my mother was English. Uh, they spoke English. I thought, how hard can it be? Um, it must be just like New Zealand, right? And I think a lot of people have that um, that sort of mindset when they move to a foreign country. If they speak, they speak English. It must be just like us. Completely different. I felt like it just I I landed in Mars. You know, it was big and bad and ugly and, and hard, really hard, tough, you know. So, so yes, whilst I was able to get that role, I'm not going to dress it up as it was. It wasn't like there was lots of fails on the way. You know, I went into places and they, didn't, they, don't, they don't care about you. You know, they don't care about who you are. And so, and so you have to be resi- resilient. You have to keep trying and, and door knocking and, and pushing. And eventually, yes, I did get into the company that I wanted to. Um, but a lot of it was to do with people I knew. I'd taken a, a contract role in an agency for a few weeks and, you know, that they knew people at Microsoft and did the introduction. And that's, you know, I, what I learned quite early on from that sort of struggle early days in London was it is really about who you know. And the biggest cities that you live in, if anyone moves from the provinces to Auckland, it's all about who you know. And that connection is worldwide. That's not a New Zealand thing. That helped me in London as well. I got a kind of an introduction to someone there. And, uh, yeah, but, yeah, so I'm, I'm experiencing that big, the bigness of the city, the diversity of yep. the city and Because when you left Auckland, it. it wouldn't have had, or Wellington, it wouldn't have had the diversity of culture at that stage, no, would it? Very no, very much. Very, very, very non-diverse. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and, you, and you hit, uh, you know, this is the great thing about 
people not just um, traveling overseas but living overseas is you immerse yourself in you know buildings with people from all around the world you know the, the, the big building flats where you're on the third floor and you're one of three flats on the third floor in Maida Vale um, and your neighbors are from Russia and 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 Portugal and South America and and you know you're hearing languages and and smelling food and you you just feel like you're in this melting pot of the world and um, I, I just loved it you just everywhere, every step you take, every breath you make is a lesson. And, you know, you sit on the tube. That's a song, Will. <laughs> it's a song. <laughs> you sit on the tube and you would, I just used to sit on the, the – like travelling on the tube to me was just wonder. Right. You, know, you know, once you've done it for 10 years, it's no longer wonder. But in those early days, I just sat there and I was just like, look around. And it was just – it was just I loved it. It was joyful seeing all that, con- you know, that colour and that diversity. So what was – what? Would, how would you describe your uh, – uh, so let's say reputation. How would you describe yourself in, the, in those at that stage? Oh, listen, I was um, the word that comes to mind is messy. Um, I really was forming my professional um, identity in those early days. So I was, tr- you know, trying to find out, trying to figure out my flow, what worked for me, um, what I was good at, um, the kind of p- tribes and people that brought out the best in me um i i i I did a lot of um you know and anybody who's worked with me will appreciate this story because you know there were times when i was a great leader and times when i was a terrible leader and manager so quite young i got to you know manage teams and manage people and you know it's i I looking looking back on it there was some messiness (laughs) there was some messiness you know it is yeah because when you're under pressure in business and you've got people under you under pressure there's a lot of there's a lot of emotionality in that, and um, yeah, you mature quite quickly under 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 fire. There's no prototyping being a leader, you know. You're in yeah. the fire pit, and you've got to figure it out. So it was messy. Um, Microsoft was tough, you know. It was it was a kind of place where you literally it was an American company, so their mindset was um, you're an employee at will. That was what they talked about, which meant that they could move you into any job they wanted. They oh. didn't have to negotiate or consult with you. Right. Um, there was that aspect. And the second aspect was you had quarterly reviews and you had to show up at your quarterly review and demonstrate your KPIs. And if you couldn't, you were gone. And so it was very – I talk about this with, with, my, with my peers that it was probably back then, we're talking now the late 90s, it was probably the most progressive environment I've ever worked in. Like I, I worked in there, I was in the European headquarters just out of London, had to travel out to Reading every day. But there was a choice because they gave you so much kit and they said, you got your quarterly KPIs, you know, produce, you don't have to come into the office, it's up to you because I had a European role. Um, and you could work at home, you could work on the beach, you could work on the cafe, but if you didn't show up with your outcomes and your outputs aligned to your KPIs that you'd agreed with your manager you knew you were going to be fired. And so it was incredibly empowering. And, you know, you figure stuff out and you, you, you – it's a scramble. Everyone's kind of scrambling to make their KPIs. It's quite competitive, but it's – but I found it – I think it's, it was very progressive. How, how old were you then? I was in my late – no, what was I? I was in my – yeah, I was in my late 20s. Early, so yeah. so you think in, in that 10 years you'd gone from Equity Corp to Saatchi to this – there's no breather on the email, is it? No, and um, work was my life. And if I, I now coach people in, you know, having, having a balanced portfolio. Uh, I didn't have a balanced portfolio. <laughs> I didn't focus on marriage or children or um, probably my family that much. You know, my family spent a long time, you know, communicating with me late at night on the phone and wondering what I was up to. Um, and it was all about, I was just in this tunnel of, yeah, I just loved. I loved learning from work. So that wasn't that wasn't an ego trip at all. It doesn't feel like it. It just felt like a learning experience. It right. just felt like, what else can I learn? What else can I do? What else can I grab onto? It was just. It just felt like a one big adventure. You know, thinking back on it, um, and I and I and that's sort of how that's. I think that's how it's coming across. Yeah, and. I just want other people now to f- have that adventure with work. I think – I don't think I took it that seriously, if I'm honest with you. I really don't think I thought of it as being a big, serious thing. I think looking back on it, it looks 
sometimes I reflect back and think, gosh, I, I had I had some good times, but you know, and I achieved a lot. But at the time, it just didn't feel like that. It just felt like a grand adventure. And I, I want people to. I think we take work so seriously now, and I think. I want more people, and particularly young people, to just treat it as a grand life adventure, you know? And, and, and then I think you take the pressure off yourself. Because if I look back, I don't think I was really... I don't think I was really engineering it in a way that, you know, I had to be this or I had to make this much right. money. I was just trying stuff out and grabbing at things and, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, which, which would create lightness and wouldn't get you bogged down. Yeah, I mean, I found myself in some places, of course, and I talk about this a lot in the work that I do now, where you you, can, you know you're turning a corner and you have to decide if you're going around that corner or you're or you're going straight. Um, you have to make the pivots. You have to make the choices. So um, leaving Microsoft to go to work for Cant Fitzgerald and being offered the job to move to New York, that was a choice. I could have stayed at Microsoft. I got offered a role in Seattle at HQ. And the reason why I chose the to leave the, one of the biggest companies in the world to go to work for a small World Trade Center, uh, Wall Street investment bank was it was a smaller company. And I thought this was a, you know, so this is conscious kind of career pivots, which is what I coach people in now. I thought that if I stayed at Microsoft, I would just be in a silo all my life. Right. I thought if I go to a smaller investment bank, I'll learn new skills. I'll be higher in the picking order. I'll be closer to the top. It's kind of like a chess game, right? And I was like, that sounds like a more interesting adventure. That sounds like I'll get more experiences there. And so rather than kind of – I think I probably would have stayed in Microsoft for life. They say at Microsoft people are lifers. Mm -hmm. They're lifers or they leave. And I chose to leave because I saw this company that was smaller and more dynamic and higher growth and different poor product portfolio. It was an, an investment bank back in the financial markets again. Um, so I chose to go there, and so so what were you what what to do what what were you going to do at that company? So I was vice president of marketing and comms for right, so Europe. So still marketing. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. This is yeah, and uh, this is a story about a sponsor. Basically, I interviewed with a woman in New York who on Skype. I think it was Skype back then. This was like nineteen ninety nine. Probably was Skype, uh, and she. She was like something from Sex in the City. She kind of wandered in late with her iced latte, which she drank all the time, and she looked beautiful and this New York accent. And I had one of my notes out, all my preparation for my interview, and she just wanted to talk about my life and what I was wearing and where I bought my clothes and what was New Zealand <laughs> like. And we were just jamming, and I was like, I want to be you. <laughs> I don't want to work with you. I want to be you. She was just this – she was just like – you know, she was from Sex in the City, and we didn't even talk about work. She said, oh, "Do you want to ask me any questions?" <laughs> and uh, and anyway, this was supposed to be a job interview. Yeah, and she just hired me on the spot. She said, "Well, you've got the job, so I'll get my people to contact you." <laughs> no details, no like, what's the role? Like, how much are you going to get paid? It was like, uh, and so I, you know, I, I went to work for this company which, with a headquarters in New York. I went to work for them in London, and then she liked me. We got on really well. Six months later, she says to me, so I'm going to be hiring a global head of marketing. The job's in New York. So you've got two choices. You can work for that person or you can be that person. <laughs> and I went back to my flatmates and said, I got offered a job in New York. Do you think I should take it? And they were just like, stop talking. Get the champagne out. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, so the reason why I talk about that is because she was my person. She was – she, and I say to people all the time, find a sponsor. Yep. find someone and there's a story about her later in life where she because you asked about this was still marketing I, I, I made another pivot a bit later to get out of marketing and she helped me with that so I found this connection with her that is rare it only happens it only, it's only happened twice in my career but when you find that person who can be your sponsor or I, champion your champion yep. and your just grab onto that person how, how, old, how old was she? she was the same age as me Oh, okay. In fact, she might have even been a year younger. Right. But she came from uh, Duke Browns and Duke University and New York, and she was very educated, and she just progressed her career faster than I had. Um, but, yeah, so so she championed. And, and you know, you know let, let, let's, be, let's be honest. Without her, my story might have been different. So not everyone gets to meet those people. But I say keep your eyes out for them mm. because they're there. And I, say, I, I did a workshop last night with 18 young people in finance and accounting and I said to them all, find, go back to your organisation tomorrow and look at the leadership team and find your person 
because if you make friends with someone who can propel you and champion your cause, can change the trajectory of your career. And, yeah, I don't think we asked for help enough, and she definitely, she was definitely a big a big power person for me. I, uh, Mel, I see it all the time with, with uh, people who have got opportunities right in front of them and they can't see it. Yeah. Or they don't recognise it. That that um, and you go, but it's right there, you know, and it's um, and they ignore it. Yeah, and asking for help, you know, I think we've got to be kinder to ourselves. We've got to, you know, I asked she, she helped me a lot in my career, and we've got to just, you can't get there on your own, you know, you've got to reach, you've got to you've got to work with people around you, and uh, you've got to collaborate in weird ways, right? And and um, yeah, and so so she was a champion for me, and. Um, Eventually, yeah, I did move to New York and, and worked for her there. And, you know, that's another part of the story, I guess, working, you know, this girl from Manurewa, right? <laughs> just, just just, hang on, Mel. Just go back to that, that point. You know, you said be kinder to yourself, right? That's a hell of a statement. What does that mean? Well, I genuinely believe you're born into this world on your own and you die on your own and that you're the CEO of your life. You're your own, you're your own champion and I think you just... You know, you have to in those meditative moments, those kind of dark moments, you have to just, you have to look after yourself. Ultimately, we're all on our own. We're all on our own. We think we've got these partners for life or these friends for life or this family for life, but actually we've only really got ourselves. And I spend a lot of time on my own. I'm actually, believe it or not, an introvert. Well, I'm on the border, but um, you're not I, a very good introvert. Not no. a very good. No, I'm a, I'm <laughs> I'm a pretend introvert for most of my friends, but I do spend a lot of time on my own, reflecting on how I can uh, help myself more. Because you know, I, I and I'm not very good at asking other people for help, but but occasionally I I realise I do need it, and when I when I need it, I'll ask for it. Um, but yeah, I just. I just think you you eighty percent of that has to come from yourself. You have you have to feed your own mind and your own heart and your own soul. And you have you have I think time on your own and reflection time and planning time is is what keeps me strong. I think you know. I and think, that's your responsibility, right? Yeah, we only have one grand one grand life, and how do you want to spend it? Mm. You know, nobody else can give you that answer. You know, mm. and it is it does come from within. You've used the word choice a lot and and uh and I love the word choice. Uh because choice is is so different than decide. Decide means to kill off options. Um so decide is you know, side comes from uh to kill and decide means to kill options. Choose is a lot softer and more forgiving. And you can choose to do something, and if that doesn't work out, you can choose something else, or yeah. you can choose to go back. Or yeah, th- th- there's always choices, and I think that sets people free as well. Because if you think your life is binary, then you put a lot of pressure on yourself to succeed at it. Yeah. If you realise that if it doesn't work out, there's other options. Yeah. Then you, the pressure comes off, right? Like nothing is. Nothing is no, nobody. Nobody has 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 finite choices. We all have multiple choices. We've just got to keep our eyes open. We have a wider horizon for what those might be. So back to New York. So you shifted from from the UK to New York to be to just be the person to be this lady, the woman's person. <laughs> yeah, I did this great job. And um, now this is uh, this is this is Wolf of Wall Street territory, right? This is. This is uh, a company that is rena- was renowned and probably still is, being one of the hardest, most masculine, um, toxic Wall Street, you know, interdealer broker. It was called. If anyone knows what that is, it's it's basically a market maker. Um, they trade between brokerage firms. They they make pricing between brokerage firms and things that are not listed, like U.S. Treasuries and bonds and. Um, so setting prices in the market and it was literally just if you've seen that movie this is the environment like you'd walk into the trading room as a woman and they'd throw paper at you or they'd pa- hold up numbers or they'd say you know <laughs> I won't say what they'd, say, what they'd yell at you so I walked into this environment that, and went are you shit. joking? Are you, like I just literally thought it was funny because I just thought are, they, are these guys for real? I just it's quite strange looking back that it didn't offend me because I just think I just thought it was like a comedy show and I just I just didn't I didn't respect them I suppose I didn't respect the people in that trading room I just tried to avoid them 
You know, I think, I think, and I wonder if sometimes, you know, you just have to do that in life. You just have to go, I can't change who they are. This is a firm that's, oh, well, I'm not going to change them. Why am I going to let them affect me? I used to just not go in the trading room. <laughs> yeah, look, it's interesting. My, my wife, Kate, um, talks about this when she was training with uh, orthopedics, which is an incredibly male-dominated area. And I said, how did you cope with, uh, uh, you know, with this whole male ego thing and she said I just ignored it yeah. and I just I ignored it and I just uh, I wanted to train in orthopaedics and I just found the best route for me and she said if I got caught up with all the bullshit I would have spent more time doing that than actually doing what I wanted to do. Yeah I say to people now you know go into an organisation and get what you need out of it and know when to leave and I think you sometimes will go into an organisation and it's not going to give you what you need. It's not right for you. And you p- probably can't change it. You know, you, mm. you probably can't. There's times when you can change the environment you're in. You've got to make that judgment call. But, you know, if you're a marketing manager in a Wall Street trading firm who's arrived, who's five minutes into the job, I can't change that. So I've got a decision to make. I either stay there and get what I want out of that, for that job that I'm in or I don't. And I chose to stay and... Yeah, I, I got a lot out of that experience. I looked for the things that were good that I could learn from it, such as the team I had, the opportunities I was given, the environment I was in for learning. I just ignored all that. I just blocked it out. I was like, I can't change it. So I'm just going to get what I need from this job. And when I've got it, I'll know it's time to leave. So, yeah, it was a, it was an incredible experience. So what did you want to get? What did you want to get from that? So that was a um, company that w- the reason why I went there was we were actually transitioning all of the trading from – desk-based electronic we were building an electronic trading platform this is back in 2000 when most phone trading was done by these interstellar brokers by phone and we were digitizing it all so we were creating algorithms and um you know program trading and i was part of the team building that and then selling it to the market so trying to bring on board new distributors and clients and uh, and as a product, traders were getting put out of jobs. Um, I was going to say, you would... It wasn't my choice, but that was part of the... That yeah, was a byproduct. you'd be pissing and, a lot of people off at that stage. It was part of the of evolution of the market, and we're seeing that now with automation and AI and machine-based learning just being applied. This was, the, this was the, some of the earliest iterations of that back in 2000. Financial markets and technology is... They're, they're, that's famous for breeding a lot of what we're seeing now in right. automation. The early days, the petri dish of that was in the financial markets, where you know automa- automatic trading kind of started back in the back in early two thousand. So, yeah, it was very progressive and it was very leading edge. It was like living at a time when no, you know, this was this was the first time program trading had kind of come into the market, right. and I just loved that. I gravitated to anything that was a first. Um, so that was what I went there for: the opportunity to be part of that campaign. Interesting. Mm. Yeah, because we take it for granted now. Mm. This was 2000, so it's nearly 20 years ago. Yeah. And uh, this is New York, and it's, you know, these, these are, they're working with big tech companies. And, yeah. um, and, you know, you see this every day. Anyone listening who trades markets, you know, or will understand what I'm talking about that, you know, it's taken for granted now. Like most stock market trading is done by machines. Um, and if you're a small investor, uh, you know, you've got to know that because you're up against the machine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you're better off to be in, in ETFs or investment funds, but that's just my opinion. <laughs> so Mel, what? Um, so how long did you stay with those guys for? Well, um, I was there for nearly two years. Um, it was cut short uh, by a global event that affected my my company very, very significantly, which I think anyone knows me knows about. Um, so yeah, I I was involved in the World Trade Center. Disaster, which so, so the office was in the World Trade Center. Yeah, it was on the World Trade Center Tower One, hundred and fifth floor. Uh, windows in the world was the hundred and eighth floor. There was two floors of kitchen. We were the hundred and seven, and then no, hundred and ten. Sorry, was there's two floors of kitchen above our offices, um, and. You know, this this building was so high that when I looked out the window, helicopters were flying below us. <laughs> when it snowed in, in this building, you were in the snow, right? Like, this is a building that shook at um, at night with the winds. If anyone has been to New York, you know, that that island quite, gets quite buffeted. I'm up on the 105th floor working late at 7 o'clock at night, and the building's moving. It was so high, and it was so... I said to people, is this normal? 
like, oh, yeah, it's, it's built to move. <laughs> I was like, right. Uh, yeah, as we've since learned, it wasn't actually built for people to escape from because all the lifts were in the middle. And, you know, when that plane hit our building, it flew right in. There's only one. Now, nowadays they build tall buildings with lift shafts in, the, in different corners. But back in the day, it was the lift shafts were right in the middle. And so if they're cut off, that's, the lifts and the stairs were all in the same place in the design. So, so Mel, the, 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 um, I can, you know, a building that size, what was, what, how many floors? So there's 110 floors in both of them. There's 30, 35,000 people, I believe, working across the two buildings. Um, so to get to my building, to my floor, you had to go up to the 42nd and then change so right. the, lifts, the lifts would only go up halfway, and then you'd change, and then you'd go up the other lift shaft. You'd go up two lift shafts. Right. And then there was a third one to go down into the subway and the shopping mall underneath. There was a massive shopping mall underneath. So there's like three – it's like a three-way journey to get to the top. Right. Um, so if you needed to go down to the lobby, you had to do like a 20-minute trip. It was like – you'd always get the junior people to go down and pick up parcels from the lobby because it was like, that's a trip. Um, but it was an incredible... I mean, anyone who's been there will remember it. It was just this feat of engineering and it was beautiful and it was quite, uh, you know, super historic now. Um, so so you're working at this company. Pretty and, cool, right? Yeah. Top five floors, yeah. They were... Gosh, I don't know how this firm managed to get that lease, but... Um, uh, Joe, uh, the the CEO uh, knew the mayor of New York, and I think he had a bit of a relationship with him. So yeah, that's how we got to be in those top five floors. Right. Mm. So, why are you alive today, Mel? Ah, yeah. So a lot of people um, ask me that, and uh, it's one of those classic sliding doors chance stories where um, I had a late night out on the Monday night. A friend of mine got made redundant and wanted to come around and celebrate and I said no Monday night got a meeting next morning Tuesday 8 o'clock got to be there big big meeting we were presenting our big campaign to the board uh, of the launch of this new platform we built eSpeed um, he was like that's not going to happen he's like we're, I'm partying with you so he came around we had a good time it was a late night probably went to bed about 1 uh, messaged my boss at quarter to 8 and said can we I'm running late sorry can we postpone we had a prep meeting at 8 for our, for our presentation and she said, actually, it suits me well. Let's postpone till nine. And so I had intended to be there for just before nine and uh, did my usual trip. You know, could stop for my iced coffee, got on the subway. Uh, subway pulls in about 8.40 and it's about a 15-minute trip to the top. Uh, coming out of the uh, subway, walking into the building and... That's when it all started. Luckily, I was just in that, just coming into the mezzanine floor of the lobby. Um, and um, that's when it all started, all kicked off, and everyone thought it was uh, a bomb or a fire or no one really knew. And did they, look, I can't remember, but did they, did they hit your building first? Or yeah, the, other one? the first one. And everyone thought it was an accident. And so I came out of the building and looked up and saw the glass and the paper, that memory is stuck in my mind, the glass and the paper against the blue sky, thinking... Gosh, I hope they put that fire out in time for our presentation. <laughs> like, just was so calm, you know, just standing there looking at the looking oh. at the flames coming out of the building, thinking, had no idea. This is like 105 floors up. You know, you can't tell. You don't know what's going on. People are running out of the building, and I literally just that's all I thought was I'd better put that. And I carried on walking, and then I noticed there was a lot of, you know, fire and police. It was getting a little bit kind of busy. Kept walking, and unfortunately, that's when I. About 20 minutes later, they saw the second plane come over. And that's when, that's, that's, that's my memory of when, for me, something changed. I felt fear for the first time in my life. As a New Zealander, I think we're lucky we don't live in a, in a community or a country where we feel fear very often for our lives. And I remember when I saw that second plane fly over at like very low height and hit the second building. That's when. You know, in an instant, I felt this adrenaline rush of if anyone has ever felt fear for their life, you know what I'm talking about. And you you just go, you literally, that fight or flight mode. And I just took off my shoes and I ran. And that's when I, that's when the panic kind of started. And so up until that moment, I, it was just a grand adventure. I was like, wow, there's a, there's a fire in my building. And then when I saw that second plane, I thought literally, this is war. We're under attack. Yeah. And yeah. it was just 
bizarre, and that's when the whole madness kind of kicked in. So, Mel, did you know a plane had hit the first tower? No. Right. Nobody did. Right. Nobody in New York City, like that whole little postcard area, everyone was like, what happened? Oh, I think... I think a small plane might have ex- – or a helicopter. Everyone, right. But nobody – everyone thought there was an accident. Right. But it was only when, when you, you know, when you saw that second plane that – I think people on television knew before we did right. what was going on. Like, because, you know, you're just wandering around. Because on, on the ground it would just be a bit of confusion. Yeah, but people were kind of calm. People were sort of like, you know, wonder, wow, that's weird. And people were sort of talking and wandering and then – when that second plane hit the whole city Everything changed. Everything changed. Yeah, and Everything then it was changed. panic. And then it was like, how do I get off how do I get off this island? Right. And, you know, I, I remember um trying to find a phone box, all the phone mesh phones were down and trying to ring my mother to tell her <laughs> that I was okay and, you know, found a card and got a phone box and then I was like, How do I get off this island? And people were just sharing cabs and it was chaos. But yeah, I mean so that was that was literally get away as fast as you can. It was like, get. lucky my apartment was on the Upper West Side, West 87th, so I had, I was a long way from the, the from the fire. So I, I managed to get in a cab with a bunch of people and we were just heading north and nobody cared about fares or it was just, let's get off the island. It was like one of those movies, you know, you're just scrambling. And so that's kind of, um, that was, you know, people often ask me about 9-11 and that day was very significant but it's what happened next that was the real, you know, because I think tragedies are interesting in that they unfold over time, like we've seen in Christchurch with the yep. earthquakes and the, you know, and the, the mosque attacks. It's like the moment is quite powerful, but it's actually what happens next that is what has the real human impact. And it's how people cope with what happened is what, it's like anything, right? And so for me, that day itself, yes, was very... But actually what happened next was much, the next three months was, and I won't go into the, all the details of it, but, you know, living with, so our company obviously had to survive. We had no building, we had no people, we had no systems, we had no paper. Um, and so we divided into two camps, those that worked on the tragedy and those that tried to keep the business going. And, and my boss and I, my wonderful sponsor, Amy, said, do you want to work on the tragedy and I'll work on the business? And I went, Okay. And I signed up to kind of set up a call centre to help the families. And so, you know, I spent three months working with the families of the people that we lost, which was pretty harsh for a 31-year-old. Um, that was the work that I had to do for about six months. And so, you know, for me, that was my lesson. Well, my lesson was helping those people get through that. So, Mel, uh, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, you, I mean, you've lost a huge number of your workmates. Yeah, and like, like this, and this is where I think, for me, something kind of changed in me about the influence of work. So they were my family. When you move cities to work somewhere, your, your workmates become your family. So I had a lot of people who were my friends. I'd had dinner in their homes. I'd travelled with them around America. Yes, and I lost, I lost them. There's still a few people that I hadn't lost, and they're my friends today. Um, but you do realise when you go to people's funerals that you've worked with how much people's people you work with are part of your life. And that's what I help people try to get to today is a place they feel safe and a place that feels like home in their work. Because I actually think if you re- – because if you otherwise, if you're with the wrong people – you're in the wrong place, and it can have a deep and a very deep impact on you on who you are as a person. Because I realised then how how impactful these people were on my life, and how and how much I felt like I'd lost. Um, and so, yeah, I think that was a turning point for my career. That was the thing I took out of it, apart from all the other personal lessons of dealing with grief and tragedy and terrorism. I, I think I really realised that the people you work with matter. They, they're just a huge part of your life. And you only realise these things in life, don't you, when they're taken away from you? <laughs> you know, yeah. you suddenly realise that it's, 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 a, it's a sad lesson, but you've got to lose le- use lessons, don't you? And for me, that's now, I think that was the beginning of this journey towards the business I've got, which is getting, finding your tribe, being happy at work is important. It matters. Okay. So, what, so Mel, why don't we, we I'm going to give you the option here. Do you want to carry on with the journey or do you want to, do you want to come forward to what you're working on today? 
Yeah, I mean, let's um, jump forward, you know, uh, leaving leaving New York, coming back to New Zealand, went back to London again. Uh, there's one more thing I would just say, though, before we talk about today is that, you know, that sponsor I had in New York, Amy, she hired me back to go back to London. Um, so I left New York, came back to New Zealand, worked for four years at NZX, um, had a great opportunity to work there, and that, that came to an end. And, she, you know, she called me out of the blue and said... I remember you always said you didn't want to be a marketing manager. I've got an opportunity for you. If you come back to London and you work for me as a year for a year as my head of marketing for Barclays Stockbrokers, I'll get you that job out of marketing. And so I just want to close out with that because, you know, I had to make a choice to go back to London after I'd come back from New York and was happy in New Zealand and but I saw, but this was a woman who said gave me an opportunity. Yeah, yeah. And so I took that and that's how I got out of marketing and became like in a COO role at Barclays. Um, and so I'm just mentioning that because I think it's important when you find those people and that you tell them what your vision is for yourself. You know, this is like six years later. She came, she came through and she said, I'm getting the band back together. She kind of pulled, pulled together a group of people that had worked in New York and um, we had an opportunity to do some great things at Barclays. So... Yeah, that's the power of those people in your life, you know. And yes, she became a closer friend because we went through the World Trade Center together. But everyone goes through stuff in life, you know. And when you go through things with people, they become at work. They become they become a champion in your life. Yeah, look, I, I I'm a big I was going to say believer in adversity. I I think adversity is a wonderful thing. Yeah, you know, it's the thing that. Uh, uh, impacts you and that's how you actually respond to the adversity that's important because some some people there so you know I see people who something happens their reaction to that thing is far more harmful than what actually happened mm. you know and they've, they've they've reacted to it in a way that's just ramps up the whole impact mm. uh, far greater than than it needed to be Scars are great memories, you know, they remind you of your wisdom. And um, we had this saying in New York, which was um, tragedy uh, doesn't change, how did we say it? it tragedy doesn't change um, the colour of your stripes or the colour of your spots. It makes them glow brighter. So what we meant by that was when you go through any adversity, this is what we learned, it doesn't change who you are. It brings out who you are, you know. So it doesn't change the colour of your stripes or your spots. It actually makes them glow brighter. So we, you figure out when you when you put yourself in those situations and you live and work through them, you know, what, what your true character is. Yeah. And, and I would encourage people not to steer away from, you know, there's lots of disruption in the world right now, right? There's lots of bad stuff that happens. And we've got a choice in New York. We could stay on working or we could quit. Like literally, you know, in September 20, we got offered the option. And um, I chose to stay because I thought I was needed and I could have an impact. And sometimes you can have an impact in, in an environment that's kind of not – it's a bit messy. It's not ideal. Just take it. You know, don't, it hasn't, it's not going to be perfect. <laughs> oh, look, I heard that. I heard that from a, a, a woman, American woman, living in Christchurch. She wasn't sure whether she was going to stay there. The earthquakes came and she went, I'm staying here. I'm needed here. And I'm going to do my work here. And now she's established there. If it wasn't for the earthquakes, she would have left. Yeah, I think sometimes we're looking for these perfect jobs and these perfect opportunities and these, you know, it's just take what you're given. You know, take what you what you get offered and make it work. And um, yeah, you can have a lot of impact when stuff's messy. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. So. That's, that's so, so you, you're, fi- you're you're now out of marketing. You're a COO in, in London. Mm. You've been back to New Zealand, and from there you came back after London back to New Zealand. Yeah. So um, banking. This is just banking was not me. You know, and I, I want people to uh, f- consider this as a lesson. You know, I had a great job, a lot of status, a lot of money, um, a, a position which I'll use the word of power p- purposefully. Because I thought that was a good thing. Um, and I hated it. I, I was so unhappy. I felt like a bird in a cage. You know, my, my boss who had hired me back had left. She, she'd gone back to the US and started a hedge fund. And I was there on my own. And the people that I loved had gone. And, and I, I was very, very miserable. And I had all the things that I thought I wanted. You know, I had money and, and status and all this freedom. And I hated my job. And, and I had to make a very, you know, choice that I help people with now, which is... You know, is is that is reward enough? And that reward wasn't enough. I had no, I was having no impact in the world. Banks were bad places to be, 
you know, arguably they still are. I had very low creative expression. I wasn't building anything anymore. I was just a paper pusher, a right. high-paid paper pusher. Right. And so I made the choice to leave. And um, my friend in London said to me, you'll never get paid so much to do so little ever again in your life. And I said, I know, and that's why I'm leaving. I was literally so unhappy with my lot. I was like, this is just greed. This is just downright greediness. Like I'm getting paid for such a low output and I was embarrassed. I looked, you know, I told you about you go, you go look, look after yourself. I looked at myself in the mirror and I was like, I don't like you anymore. Well, who are you? You know, <laughs> and I literally fired myself from my own job. I was like, you got to go. And my friends in London were like, what? This is just so easy. We're making so much money. I said, I know. You know, I look back on it now and think <laughs> it was easy, but it wasn't sad. It was my soul was hurting. So, yeah, dropped a line into New Zealand, got lucky to, um, you know, meet Jeremy Moon from uh, Better by Design, the chairman of um, Better by Design in New Zealand. And he asked me to, he met me in London and said, do you want to come back and uh, use your experience for New Zealand business? So joined Better by Design and learned design thinking, human-centered design at Stanford, redesigned their program with them, hired a whole bunch of design coaches, you know, spent, a, spent nearly two years working in that space, which was really um really back in my homeland again you know I'm back in creativity I'm back in like design I'm back in and so this was a really interesting homecoming because it's like design and business it was my sweet spot it was like this is kind of a mixture of all the business experience I'd gained combined with like design and creativity so it was a great opportunity for me to work with um, a really amazing crew. So what, what's it like transitioning back from New York and London back to little old New Zealand? It was actually really hard and I know that sounds um What's the word? It sounds uh, privileged, but it was really hard because it was reverse culture shock. And a couple of things stood out for me when I came back, which really disappointed me. One was um, the quality of our leaders here. I was really, literally quite shocked. Even though, you know, Wall Street and, and Canary Wharf and, and, you know, they're not ideal places, they do, there's a lot of very good leaders. That they, you know, leadership is a skill. It's an art, it's a science, you have to invest in it. And I came back to New Zealand and I was just like, where's our leaders? I just, I was very, they were few and far between. And I'm not saying there's not good leaders here, of course there is. But there's also a lot of really bad leaders. They're not leaders, they're managers. And so I noticed that. And then the second thing I noticed was that, um, yeah, business just seemed really, really playful, almost kind of casual and um, not intentional and not... I just I think it lacked a bit of kind of um, productivity, or there was some kind of messiness about it that I just was struck me as really quite quite odd. Like I just I just think we're we're quite casual about how we run our businesses, and I think there's a friendliness about it. But if it, you know, like anything, if it goes too far, it can become a, a weakness. Um, and there was low accountability. There was low leadership. There was people being, you know, hired in jobs and left and not really happy and there was just this kind of messiness about. So that's kind of what I noticed, my, my first impression when I came back. Um, but yeah, so I was a bit, I, I found that quite hard. I found it quite hard to adjust and I think people who, who remember me when I came back, when I first started at NZT, I was kind of struggling. I was struggling to find my place, um, which I think I've found now. But So, you know, we suffer from low productivity in New Zealand. It's still there. Yeah, I, I just I just don't think, and this is kind of where I'm starting to play now with my business, I don't think we're really unlocking true. Like, I got really coached and I got really um, conscious leadership from people. You know, I've talked about a couple of, of those people. Uh, and, you know, they really propelled and helped, you know, my environment at Microsoft and the, the woman from Canada Fitzgerald and Barclays. They were really pivotal in driving me to be the best I could be. And they really took a personal interest in me. And I just think we need more of that. Right. We need to really unlock people's value. There's a lot of Kiwis that have got so much to offer, and what they need is they need people to help them unlock that value. So that is a great segue into what you're doing now. Yeah, because you know, look, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. Well, the the we spend a lot of time at work. Yeah, uh, we spend you know a huge part of our life at work yeah so work is work is um your self-identity it's your self-worth it, it creates a lot of confidence it gives you a lot of safety or security you can contribute to the world you can have impact it contributes to your community your family etc and therefore because of all of those great things 
it can also be, if it's not working for you, a great source of unhappiness. And, you know, we know that about 60% of people are not in engaged work, according to lots of research studies that have been done. And that that troubles me. Like, I have felt the impact of work in my life, and I know how um, much it can, and I see it every day around me that people are not happy in work. So that's my cause. My, my cause is to try and you know, get more people into productive, purposeful, sustainable work that um, grows them, their community, and our economy. Right. So we could wrap up there, Mel, but we're not going to. <laughs> I, so tell me about Start Night now. What is, what is it doing to make the world a better place? Uh, so what I did with Start Now was I decided to take my combined skill set of business and design thinking and apply it to the very modern challenge of people being unhappy in their work. So what does that mean? Um, I've created a, a framework, a toolbox, a set of, uh, set of tools to help people uh, figure out what they can do and how to transition into it. So you take a story of a, of a young lawyer who's 29 years old and she's on the partnership track at a big law firm in Auckland uh, and I met her, and she's unhappy. She's not found her tribe. She doesn't believe that law is a sustainable career. She sees all the patterns, all the um, you know, the, you know, the the routine work that's involved. It's not what she thought it would be. Um, she comes to me. We unpack what it is that you know brings her joy and happiness, brings her energy. Bring she feel. Did, how does she feel engaged? We do a discovery workshop. Just just, just on that. So can that be difficult to pe- for people to work out what brings them joy? Not with a good process. No, I call it unpacking your brain. Right. So you know, everyone who's listening knows what brings them joy and happiness. How, how do you unpack that into something you can use? So, but they ex- need they need help. I think some people do. Yeah. Yep. Lo- most people like. I think I think we can speed it up with a good process. It's like anything, right? It's like any kind of innovation. If you work, if you're a company and you're trying to do innovation. You can you can do it in a messy, long kind of you know unstructured way, or you can follow a really good proven process and commit time and energy to it and make you know make it quite purposeful. So what I do is I work with people for no more than nine hours, which I often talk about and say you know it's the equivalent of flying to Perth. Uh, in nine hours, we can unpack your story and figure out at least three alternative options for you in your life. And that's what I do with people. And, and, yeah, so it starts with just... So the lawyer is like, I'm in the wrong job. I'm unhappy. Help me. You know, she her whole life she wanted to be a lawyer. Um, anyway, we unpacked it and we figured out that, you know, like a lot of young people, she wants to help people. She wants to have impact. She wants to create something. Um, and we figured out what she's really passionate about. She's really passionate about the fact that millennials and Gen Zs don't have good coaches. And so she prototyped within her law firm... How might she create a coaching forum for young people? Uh, and her law firm, you know, had an opportunity with that to shift her into that role. And she was attracting lawyers from all all around Auckland. And they kind of said, you know, we didn't hire you to do this. We hired you to be a lawyer. So guess what happened? She left. And now she's got a successful business running uh, coaching for Gen Zs, which is a very different way of coaching because it's much more um, contributive and, and collaborative than coaching for, for 40 or 50 year olds uh, and she designed something a program to a lot of research and now she's got a little startup business and she's super happy and you know she probably still helps people out with with commercial law on the side for a bit of income but it's not her she, that's just some one of her strings in her bow so that's what I help people with and 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 for her it set her free and and she, you know that's what she's living a purposeful sustainable lifestyle now for her she's moved down to Wanaka and she flies around New Zealand running these the, these co- and she's set free and 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 she's contributing to the economy she's contributing to people's lives and she's not stuck behind a computer in a law firm going nowhere which she could have done for another 10 years and got paid a lot of money and and it would be seen as uh, as a good career yeah and that is a good career for some people and i'm not saying that you know y- 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 all lawyers are you know but just for her it wasn't working yeah. you know everyone's different right it's like just finding your pathway so Mel, that's working with individuals do you have something to work with larger so, number of people yeah so we work with people one-to-one we work with people in groups but what i'm really interested in is working inside organizations now and this is where it gets sticky 
um, because I believe that because of all the organisations I've worked in around the world, I believe we're fundamentally not helping people inside the organisation to figure this stuff out. And what that's doing is it's un, it's it's closing off opportunities for us as an organisation to unlock new value and it's keeping our people unhappy, keeping them in a box. So a lot of employers have a mindset of I have to keep my people, I have to keep them in their job that they're in, God forbid they leave, God forbid that you know they show any interest in doing anything different, that doesn't suit me. Well, guess what? It doesn't suit people to be stuck in something that you know is, is not allowing them to grow and learn and contribute value. It will contri- you, you will unlock so much more value for your organization by entering into a dialogue about what they want to do and what they want to become and enabling them to, to take on maybe a second or a third role in your organization than what you're offering them today. Uh, that's hard for companies, but I think we can unlock a lot of value for organizations and for people if we start changing that construct around. Most people just hire someone, put them in a job, do a performance review once or twice a year, and hope they stay. I'm interested in how might that person create more for your organization. How can we unlock their talent within your organization and help them figure that out? That's spooky. Why? It's spooky. It's spooky. It scares people, maybe, but yeah, because you know, I think about that and go, the managers are, you know. So as a creative person, I sit there and go, I would be really drawn to that. But I could imagine a lot of managers just going, how do I control the smell? How do I, you know, you're letting the... Why do you want to control it, though? Well, because because, uh, I don't know what's coming, you know, all that. So I'm just, I'm trying to put my, I'm trying to put, be devil's advocate here because I think it sounds fabulous, right? But... For, but I'm thinking from a from a traditional management role, you're letting this opening Pandora's box and letting all this creativity out, and then how do you how do you cope with that? So you talked earlier about choices, right? As a manager, you have a choice. You can how you manage your people or lead your people will directly have an impact on your degree of success. So I believe that you have a choice with your people. You can allow them to tell you how much value they can create or if you if you don't allow them to tell you that they will they will tell somebody else they will leave if you don't allow them to be the beautiful pot plant or flower that they want to be if you keep them in a in a dark room and 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 just say no no I only want you to grow this high because that's what suits me okay so if we if we take that model Mel and go back to your New York KPI type you know environment are they still going to be able to hit their KPIs? Because the business has still got to do the business. Totally. Totally. You, you, you co-create with your employees what the outcomes are that will, will allow them to have full contribution value and is aligned to where the organisation is heading. So you have to have alignment, right? An organisation has a purpose, it has a strategy, it has vision, it has values. So do people. People have purpose, vision and values for their life. If you can get that aligned... We're going to go faster. We're going to we're going to work smarter, not harder, right? So if you've got people in your and organization, have more fun and have more fun, and guess what? If you've got people in your organisation that are not aligned on your purpose, your values, and your vision, you want them off the bus as soon as possible because yep. they're going to slow you down. And this is the thing we don't understand. We we try to keep people because we're afraid. We've got the scarcity mindset. We're afraid if we lose them, we might not be able to replace them. Well, guess what? Maybe it's a good thing if we lose them because they're probably underperforming anyway and they're, and they're possibly getting low on productivity which leads to toxicity which leads to ambivalence which leads to all kinds of negative things and then it's much harder for the organization we want to turn people over this is this is a, a this is a, a large market mindset that we need to bring into new zealand i think which is allowing people to find their place get people on or off the bus allow them to grow with you rather than kind of keeping people in job functions doesn't, it doesn't throw in any of the things like KPIs or performance outputs. It just means you co-create and you continuously co- co-create those with your employees. It's just a different leadership style. And I think there's companies in New Zealand that are already adopting it and that are quite progressive. Um, it's just that they're few and far between. So what's getting in the way of people taking this on, this attitude? Uh, I think confidence. I think uh, experimentation. Uh, my view in life is that you have to prototype things, you have to try things and take some risk, test things out. So I always encourage companies having a lot of good conversations with companies now about piloting this approach and uh, 
you know, determining if this can create more value for them. So it's not all change. It's like companies that are moving to agile. It's like try it, you know, try it in a, in a part of your organisation and see if, you know, having a different conversation with your employees about co-creating roles for them and designing their future inside the organisation, see if that can create more value for you than how the other part of the organisation is managing people. Test it. I'm pretty confident. I'm going to have some case studies soon. Yep. You know what, Mel? I, I, it's funny. You exude the confidence. I sit there and go, yeah. So how do we – so I'm all about, you know, speeding stuff up and good stuff, you know, and, and bringing it to the fore. So how are we going to bring this to the fore, Mel? What's well, I call it an intervention. So sometimes when you're trying to design change – you need to have if there's a if there's a if there's a failing in the market or there's something's not working right. You need a bit of an intervention, whether it's a glue or a you know a valve or a, and I and I call it like a dialogue intervention, right? So at the moment we have this binary um, relationship with our employees, right? Which is I'm the boss, you're my employee. I say what happens and you do, right? And if you do well, I promote you. I want to change that construct and I want to bring in a different kind of dialogue into the organisation. So we're designing together what my future looks like. So uh, an intervention is a safe place with a good process. And so that's what we've got. We've got a a good process. And because we're neutral, we can be an intervener. So it's almost like a facilitator. It's a negotiator. So you you as the owner of the company have a direction you're going in. Your people have a direction they're going in. Let's figure it out together. So let's have a good intervention and a good dialogue around how we can create more value together. So the cool thing with this interview, Mel, is that I'm reflecting on where you started from. You know, you've had a hell of a journey, right? And all that experience coming forward now, and we've got you back in New Zealand. Hopefully we keep you here. And now you've come up with this... this I call it's, it, a, it's a paradigm shift, eh? I call it human innovation. I call it um, how do we innovate our lives? How do we... Innovation is a continuous process. It's iteration. It's pivoting. It's trying new things. It's like that's what we've got to do as humans. We don't want to get stuck. We've got to. But you know what I've learned is for some people that comes naturally. For other people, they need a bit of help. You know, I think I've probably been quite good at pivoting and iteration. Um, I've now learned a process and I've built a methodology around how to help others be better at that because I think it will help us all be have more create more value in our work be more productive companies get faster and smarter um so it is human innovation it's how do we keep iterating pivoting and growing creating more value what what i'm loving about this uh, uh, is that you know all the innovation is around tech you know we hear about tech and ai and all this sort of stuff all the time so this is taking it right back to the humans helping people innovate their lives yeah create more value solve more problems have more impact That's what innovation is, right? And we apply it to businesses and products and technology. We don't stop. I mean, most people spend, you know, hours, days and weeks planning their wedding, their holiday, their house renovation. How much time do you spend designing and innovating your own life, thinking about your career, being conscious, having conversations in the workplace about what else you can do, what other value you can create? I've learned through adversity and tragedy that people are capable of so much you know, young people are capable of so much. Middle-aged people, old people, we're all capable of so much. We just need to be unlocked and allowed. And creativity, good creative processes, create a safe space for people to explore that. So we help people design multiple possible futures, multiple possible ways they can grow in the company and try things. And if you're an owner of a business, don't you want that for your people? Don't you want your people to be creative and growing and building skills? You know, you look around, I mean, I know I've managed big teams. You know half of them have got dead eyes. Half of them are sitting there going, geez, is this it for me? We know that, but we, but I want to help companies. Yep. I want to help companies unlock that because yep. it is hard for business owners. You know, they're trying to make money, trying to make profit. They're dealing with a lot of stuff. The last thing they need is how do I help Johnny in the corner be more creative? Well, maybe they need a little bit of help with that. Yeah. So Mel, how, do, how do people find you? Pick up the phone and call me. Yeah? Yeah. I mean, we've got a website, startnow.co.nz. Um, I, I love having conversations with people. Um, happy to come in, talk, chat. I love whiteboard sessions. 
Uh, I'm not, if anyone knows me, I'm not a hard salesperson, <laughs> much to my demise. <laughs> I just like, I, I love what I do and um, I just want to help. So you can work with individuals, you can work with organisations. Yeah, we can do some really great, one of the things that I've learned in life is when you get diverse teams together, people can be a bit freer. So industry organisations, I work a bit with the Accounting Association, I work with the Tech Futures Lab, you know, diverse groups of people who, you know, come together and help each other. So last night we had 18 people helping each other with different ideas for their futures. It's a really creative way to help people unlock new ways of thinking about their future. Okay. So startnow.co.nz? Yes. Is how they'll find you. Yeah, or on LinkedIn. Yeah, I'm happy to come and have a chat with anyone who individually or professionally wants to talk about how to how to use use my skills and my toolbox uh, and the team that I've got around me to create more value. Well, thank you so much for this. Uh, for and look, uh, I, I loved it. We, Mel and I had a coffee before this, and she went ninety minutes. There's no way, you know. No way that we'll talk for 90 minutes. I said, oh, yes, we will. Yes, we will. Uh, Mel, this has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you uh, for your time. Love having you back in New Zealand. And uh, and understanding more how you can help companies because – and it's so nice to be talking about people rather than just tech and AI and so forth, that humans do have a future. Of course. Of course we do. All power to us. You've just been listening to an episode of Stuff That Matters Now brought to you by Collective Intelligence. I hope you enjoyed listening to the fun stuff, the rugged stuff and the complete stuff up that have helped this particular Collective Intelligence member evolve while making the world a better place. Do check out our Stuff That Matters Now podcast series on your favourite podcast provider or visit our website www.collectiveintelligence.co.nz to get links to new episodes. Contact us if you want to learn more about how we can help you evolve yourself and others. Thanks for listening.